So uh, we've got uh, plenty of questions. So they'll have no problem running through all these. Um, these guys have promised to answer every single question as long as it takes. So we'll be here all day. But, uh, so we're, we're going to go for a little while. And then um, I could ask Zena maybe or somebody to just kind of give me a time check. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through the stack. We'll go as far through as we can. And um, yeah, we'll see where, see where we go from here. So thanks for all your input. Um, OK, so uh, first question, and I'd like to address everybody here. Um, uh, actually, you know what? Sorry. Let me do some introductions first. So apologize. Let me do introductions. Um, uh, first, uh, I have uh, Olivia March. I'm just going to let you do your own introduction. How's that? Um, I work at the ACCC, so the Australian Competition Consumer Commission in the energy regulation sector. We have six Drupal websites and I've just been involved in the development of the most recent one and previous government and education experience. And I'm Vesa Palmo. I'm the CEO of Wundercrowd. Uh, Wundercrowd was formed last summer by merging some European Drupal shops, uh, namely Crimson, uh, Mera and Note1. And uh, including some private individuals, so so we are today 150 people focusing only on Drupal uh, in nine European countries. So it's rather distributed organization for now. I'm Philip Rubin, chief architect with CINT, which is a Brazilian company. Uh, we have about 1,600 uh, people, but about 300 developers or talents in Drupal spread out across Brazil, China, and Argentina. So doing global support and development for organizations farm organizations from U.S. with global reach, uh, pretty much. Uh, and I'm Jeff Walpole. I'm the CEO of Phase 2 Technology, uh, based in Washington, D.C. and New York. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, the, the token uh, United States representative here. So, um, okay, so our first question, um, is using open source different than proprietary for enterprises? And if yes, why? So how is open source different for enterprise organizations? I mean, from the companies I have worked before or currently working on, uh, the challenge when it comes to using open source and compared to proprietary in terms of support, for example, that's the first thing that comes. But later on, as they start adopting open source, that really gets mitigated. So uh, in the end of the day, it goes down to, to the license fees uh, and, 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 and that part related to it. And, uh, and really getting to know and how to work with the community and work with something that they don't have so much control at when compared to calling to a company or to a proprietary model organization. I guess that's one of the big differences that I felt when selling Drupal or putting positioning Drupal within large enterprises and they were used to that proprietary model and then uh, they, they need to change the mindset and really get the benefits out of the Drupal community, which is basically, in my view, uh, the, the flexibility and time to market. So uh, that's something that was really different for, for those organizations. Yeah, um, I think the real bigger difference is if, if you're working with somebody uh, with, let's say, a single vendor CMS uh, against the big, big ecosystem, if it's open or closed, I think that's the largest difference with, with uh, potential vendor lock and, and so on. Uh, that being said, with some commercial products, um, you might not get what you really want, and sometimes it's impossible to, to get some new features in and, and these kinds of things, but I don't think if, if that's really all that common. I would dare to say that there are not that many differences. The community aspect is, is, is a big difference because you, you can't just pay money for somebody to support it, or you can, but that's not going to be enough in all cases if you are like large-scale Drupal uh, user, for example. Uh, but mostly, I don't think it's a major difference, actually. I don't think you get much of a difference from the user level, but I think in terms of the executive level and trying to sell it up, there's a perception that open source isn't as safe or secure. Um, but there's also a lot of noise in the open source sort of market, whereas a single vendor you know who you're talking to in open source, the, the message can get confused, especially at a non-technical level. Great, great. Um, now a very provocative question. So, um, do you genuinely think that Drupal is amazing or is it simply the best there is? I.e., is it just the best poo in a pile of poo? I'm not making this up. This is what people write. <laughs> What's that? 
Yes, you can tweet that. Just don't attribute it to me. Um, what do you think? I don't think I'll use the same language. Um, I don't know if it's the best. I do kind of look at everything in terms of the best tool for the job. Um, it is one of the better, that's for sure. Um, but I don't think there's any perfect solution that fits everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to go with the poo one. Uh, but uh, I, I personally have some sort of love-hate relationship with Drupal and um, it lacks a lot of things. Uh, but that being said, it's the best solution out there currently. Um, so definitely the, the best option for, for large enterprises at least. Yeah, I agree with you guys. Uh, there's no silver bullet. And one important thing is about the right tool for the right job, right? So uh, I'm like you, I have also the hate and, and love thing with Drupal. So uh, I've seen cases where people chose to use Drupal and just screw up by using that for the wrong purpose. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's the, the overall plan in any ways. Did you want to caveat that those were not the official uh, thoughts from the Drupal Association and your, your, your board seat? <laughs> I'll, I'll do that for you. Um, okay, uh, this is a pretty simple question, but it's also a very complex question, and it's one that I think a lot of us get a lot, which is what's the real competition for Drupal? And of course, we realize that different sizes and in different places, it's different. So I think it's interesting, mainly from a regional perspective, to hear um, you know what you're seeing in the countries that you're in. And I'd also be interested in terms of size. You know, is it large enterprises is it different than you know what you're seeing as sort of simple website building software? That's a really good question, um, and it's we have physical offices in nine different European countries and, and for us each market is different if you look at the competition today. I can't say there would be like one primary competitor and definitely it also comes to the scale as well. Uh, somebody could say WordPress is the biggest competitor for Drupal. Uh, in, in enterprise level that's definitely not the case today but that may be the case in few years uh, if you look at how, how WordPress is uh, moving forward today. Uh, but I would say it's mostly proprietary software solutions uh, which are different from market to market. Uh, they range from Java to, to Microsoft to whatever, basically. I think our list of primary competition has something like 20 products today. Uh, and as I said, different from one country to another. I would be interested to hear what those are in, in the Australian market, though. Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, I'm not going to risk and take some names, but um, in my past two experience when selling Drupal and I'm more focused on large enterprises, uh, there was just a couple of two that were standing out out there against Drupal and Drupal in the end was just the SPS case was the winner, uh, but was more a Java one, uh, I think uh, Oracle Fat, uh, was called Fatwire. So, uh, and also in Brazil, so that, that case was the US first. So even in the US for a, a Fortune 50, uh, Fortune 50 uh, pharmaceutical company, they chose Drupal on top uh, against uh, this uh, Oracle Fat Wire. And also in Brazil, Oracle was really big over there with the new CMS product, which I forgot the name. But I was a big contender uh, with Drupal over there. So uh, that's what I've been facing more in terms of competition, but it's still. And my focus, our company is more towards digital marketing, so all the sites that we've been building uh, is not specific use case like Telemas or any or, or government, but it's more like fi final sites or websites for consumers. So that's where Drupal is really standing out, even for, uh, even with such proprietary solution. If I can quickly add, actually, something. <laughs> uh, funnily enough, uh, I'm I'm currently based in the UK, and uh, our biggest competition there is uh, everything but Drupal, because there are so few big Drupal shops. So quite a few customers have been recently leaving Drupal because they've been so disappointed that they can't find uh, proper big Drupal vendors to actually help them out. Uh, and, and they've been leaving to Java or Ruby on Rails and, and to commercial solutions and, and to all sorts of directions. So uh, like big part of my job in, in, in UK at the moment is to sell our competition. <laughs> Tell that you, we have great competitors here and, and you can, you're not gonna get stuck with us if, if you want a big Drupal sort of funny place to be at trying to say upsell your competition all the time, but uh, in some of our markets, that's what we absolutely have to do like every day. 
Okay, I've got a few. Um, in government, it's pretty much better the devil you know often, and it's often a, a Microsoft solution. Um, Kentico is the, the latest one that's been pushed a lot. Um, but then you're competing with legacy systems, so people are used to SharePoint. They don't refer to an intranet, they refer to SharePoint. They don't know the difference. So it's in terms of they don't know the difference between CMSs or that there are more than one. Um, in Victorian government, it's very much my source matrix, um, which I hate. Um, so I guess it, it depends. In terms of the education sector, it's either Moodle or um, Blackboard in Australia. Great. Um, so, oh yeah, sure. Uh, in the US, I'd say um, definitely WordPress. Uh, Wordpr WordPress and Joomla for open source CMS uh, on the more sort of ubiquitous CMS side. Um, larger uh, enterprises, uh, I would say Adobe CQ5 um, tends to be uh, the thing that is cropping up the most and um, team seems to be um, competing with Drupal and, and doing a good job at it uh, at the top level. Um, tends to demo real well, shows real well. Um, don't, don't know how well it actually works, but um, you know, I'm sure one of the fine folks from Acquia can whip up all the research on how it compares. <laughs> Um, so, uh, next question I have uh, for you guys is is a little bit more of an architectural question, and and you know the the beauty of sort of crowdsourcing our questions like this is you get a variety of different uh, perspectives and what people are interested in. And this one's a little bit more architectural, so so bear with me. But the the trend in enterprise solutions seems to be um, to serve many many websites in a traditional IT systems approach. Um, and then it's a question. Why not produce many, many individual sites as disposable IT solutions so you never have to upgrade, you just rebuild, um, you have no cross-site integration issues, and you keep up the, the pace of fast and light web? Uh, so in other words, uh, using Drupal as open source without licensing fees, can we, can we build disposable websites faster and cheaper than building a, a monolithic platform? Um, I think you can say there's pluses and minuses. Migration of content is always going to be an issue, so if you've got a standard format and can automate that. Um, but in my experience being sort of government sector and education, people want the information they want, they don't want to hang out. So the second you move a resource or you move a page even, you'll get handwritten letters, emails, everything. Um, I worked at the Bureau of Meteorology for a while and I think they moved where one of the forecasts for, for um, farming was and the number of complaints that were made just because they changed one level of architecture was insane. So if you're creating m multiple disposable sites, there's not many people that want to sort of invest the time to relearn how to use your site unless you quite have quite a dynamic audience. So I think in terms of consistency of, of user experience is probably the, the main risk in that one. Um, I think one of the great sides of Drupal is that you can do so many things with it and, and I find that we do three things all the time. We do massive sites that have everything in one site and, and multi-site profiles, whatnot. Uh, we do platform as service kind of sites internally for customers where they can deploy 50 or 500 sites internally. Let's say a big university, for example, they're gonna end up having hundreds if not thousands of sites internally and that's more like platform as a service kind of thinking. And I find we also do quite a bit of like, I don't know if they're exactly disposable, you think of them as disposable, but it's really difficult to get rid of the sites in the end. <laughs> uh, but sometimes it is actually really good to, to quickly just whip up a site uh, with a small budget. And, and the developers tend to hate it because it's not as challenging because you can do it out of the box with Drupal really fairly easily. Uh, but it's sometimes it's really a good solution for, for the customer. So I, I would say there's no single right answer to, to the question. Yeah, I, I agree too, uh, and I, I think Oliva hit the point about consistency. So um, I, again, with the customers that we've been working on, they came from uh, an area or a scenario where they had hundreds, thousands of websites dispersed, pulverized across the organization, different departments, different requirements, and it was a madness to maintain all of that and be able to provide the same experience. One department we he would hear from the other department about the benefits they would have that on that website, and they wanted it all, and then it's a sometimes a different technology, so we start losing control across a large enterprise. So keeping consistency is really key for IT department to maintain and manage the, the, the platform. 
Yeah. Um, so I, I would just I would like to ask, add as well. I think that from my perspective and the, the my company's perspective, uh, like Vesa's, we've done a variety of these different platforms. What I find most interesting and most fascinating and helpful about Drupal is that it's capable of doing all those things. So the SB, SBS case study earlier where you've got a large platform and you insert Drupal into a stack that includes a variety of other things is possible. Um, the disposable website concept is also possible. We've done that for a publisher where they have a very strong content repository and a system of feeds and APIs and we were able to spin up hundreds of websites that you just throw away when you're done um, that are just you know not even really more than a standard theme, some CSS changes, and they just inherit content from this feed. And when you're done with them, you don't, you don't need them anymore. All the, all the content resides in the repository. So it's interesting that we can do all those things. Um, so uh, transitioning to a few individual questions based on your experience. Um, uh, Felipe, someone wants to know, uh, what is your biggest frustration and pain point operating a software development company? I guess, uh, and I think it would be like more like Drupal related, right? Or yeah. Sure. Um, so if I can stick with that, when we started with Drupal, first was really the, the, the learning curve and training and getting resource. And uh, once we start, sh we reach a certain level, we establish our own training center within the company. Then it was mitigated. After that, working with different customers, uh, I guess. Uh, would be the mindset of uh, open source, working with customers that we're not used to, and then being able to manage the whole modules, which platforms would be created based on those modules for those customers. And, and of course, the developers wanted to use different modules that are out there, and then be able to manage correctly with the right customer and the right modules for that. I guess from a Drupal perspective, that's the, the, the biggest challenge from a project manager, from my team, when dealing with the developers and, and, and being able to keep up with what the Drupal community is putting out there for, for us to leverage. Oh no, hold, hold the mic, I'm good. <laughs> so this one is good for Vesa. Um, Vesa, since the formation of Boondrupal last year, how has the scale of a larger Drupal company assisted you in winning against other enterprise competitors? Well, um, it has uh, and it hasn't. Um, I think um, it hasn't really helped us to win uh, more business for Drupal as such uh, because um, at least in European market currently there are not that many big and credible uh, Drupal players. There are really big IT giants like Accenture and Capgemini there, uh, but when you actually have a look at how much resources they have, they, they are relying mostly on freelancers today and they have some of their own teams. but they haven't really s built up the, the competency. Uh, so our goals with all of all of the merger and everything we did were like to, well, one of the goals was to create a bigger and more credible player for big enterprises because they just don't want to work with, with shops that have 10 or 20 people uh, on staff. They, they find it's too scary to work with small players often. I don't personally, I don't know why, but that's, that's their policy. Um, so it has definitely helped us to, to win a lot of business when we compete against um, other Drupal vendors. Uh, but that's not our primary goal. Our primary goal is to expand Drupal. Um, so in that, yes, it's been helpful, but we would need to have a couple more wonder crowds in order to, to make a really big splash. So if somebody wants to do one for Australia, <laughs> why not? Um, so but I think my, my answer is yes and no. And now, for both of you, a question from your panel uh, panel mate here. Um, uh, what are your pet peeves when responding to tenders or in dealing with customers? What can and should be done differently by the customer specifically? <laughs> um, that's, that's always a uh, difficult question because you get all sorts of... Uh, request for proposals. Um, half of them are complete crap, to be honest. Uh, half of them are uh, okay or excellent. Um, my biggest problem with those is usually the, the legal department when they get involved. Um, because we do only agile projects, and that's a nightmare for most legal departments. 
so they want to know everything ahead of time and everything has to be fixed. Has to be fixed schedule, budget, scope, everything. And uh, I, I think that's the, that's the worst thing for us. Um, so if I would have to just name one thing, it would be the, the design first kind of thinking that especially many of the large enterprises are still into and, and public, uh, public organizations often as well. Uh, luckily that's changing slowly, uh, but today it is the, the like primary problem I have. Uh, on my side, something I guess similar will be work with the customer in partnership. So when it comes to RFPs, we've been discussing later about a new RFP that comes out and then you get the whole team set up for that and then the customer just cancel that and you have all the team ready to start a Drupal excellent team and then you just have to think about what to do with the development. And even when you have an agreement with the customer for six months or a year, the change will come and uh, there's sometimes not so much partnership in terms of working with your vendor and making the best usage of that team to, to help your business. I guess that's, as a, as a system integrator, that's one of the biggest pains. And that goes across the large organization. Different departments, they just wouldn't worry about, only about what the, their business are, not so much about what they can deliver. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, it's really, we try, we also use Agile. Uh, so uh, we try to, w we show them uh, by, by using a, a dedicated team for a long time, uh, it's better for them to get to know your business. So uh, not only the Drupal uh, learning curve, but uh, learning the business. So trying to get a long-term commitment, that's only beneficial for them. And that's where Agile really gets into place with the Scrum methodology that we use 100% as well. Uh, and when we are able to show to some of the customers, they really get into that. And then we have a partnership for, for a few years. But uh, there are still some businesses, some large enterprise that, that have a, a hard time getting into that model. So that's we, or where we struggle, our project managers, business directors struggle to convince to get on board with that model. So Jeff, what's yours? All the above, maybe. Um, so we, we see a lot of uh, delays in, in RFPs or tenders. Um, uh, customers that put them out and then take a long time to make decisions, that's frustrating. Um, I think also just uh, customers not realizing the right level of detail that's helpful um, to, a, to a vendor. So you know, if you're, if you're putting out uh, a tender for something that's uh, you know, a Drupal site and you're down and you're specifying modules uh, or versions or anything like that, or you're talking about content types or taxonomy or nodes, uh, you've gone too far, <laughs> stop and uh, refocus on what problems you're trying to solve and let, let the vendors who are responding um, prescribe the appropriate uh, technical implementation. I think that's probably the number one um, that we see more often. Um, so, yeah, sure. Now, now that you get me started, uh, I think one of the yeah, one of the uh, really big mistakes uh, some customers do, they don't really reveal their budget at all. Uh, it's like you would go and, and try to build a house and they ask like, okay, how much can you afford to invest? Well, whatever, give me an offer for a house. It's, you know, just you can't tell for some cases unless you have some idea what the budget range is. And it's, I, I've been also buying services and I al always put in like exact amounts like, well, this is what it, it can cost. So let us know what the quality would be on that and, and everything instead of just trying to get the lowest possible price because this is absolutely buying a web website is, is like buying a car or a house without defining anything else. If you just get the cheapest one, you'll, you'll know what you end up getting. So. so changing gears a little bit, um, we've talked uh, quite a bit today about um, technology platforms. Um, let's talk about content, because uh, obviously content is the most important aspect, the reason that we have a content management system to begin with. Um, Olivia, can you tell us a little bit about um, any lessons you have in terms of incorporating legacy content, migrating content, um, things like that in terms of Drupal implementations? 
Um, I'm a big fan of automatically sort of scraping it and reloading uh, as required. But um, if you're looking at a distributed website or a legacy website that's potentially built in something like Lotus Notes, you're not going to get that sort of, um, you're not going to be able to really leverage that. So I think p um, procedures and policies come first. So how often do you review content? What is archive content? And sort of what is necessary? Um, one thing we have done is across sort of agency, uh, across departmental teams. So people from the different business units that represent the content have come along to web training, have come along to accessible accessibility training, um, have come along to writing for the web, um, and it's their responsibility to manage the content within their area, whether it's migrated or whether it's archived. Um, so putting it back on the business units that created it and setting a, a standard to meet for future. So. Uh, part governance and uh, in the, the order that you tackle things, but then also ownership. Right. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, I would like to ask all of you, because I think this is probably uh, a good question for everybody to be thinking about, but um, what are the biggest blockers for the enterprise to sharing their code back to the community? So what examples have you seen in which uh, – People are doing a good job of sharing their code back and examples maybe where they're not and, and why. Uh, I have two customers, one on each side. Uh, one just started Drupal a year ago, large enterprise as well, but the right mindset. So the background of the person, the decision maker that chose the platform across the organization globally, he started with that, so we wanted to build something, we're gonna be leveraging what's out there in the community, and I wanted to give it back. And you, Philippe, as a vendor, you do have authorization to whatever code that is not specific to our business, you guys can do it, make it perfect, and, and give it back to the community. The other organization is just, they don't have this mindset, they don't have the people with that, it's just uh, the whole background, think about proprietary, think about scary, uh, what that means, put a code out there, and I could really sacrifice my business if I do it. And so it's really hard to sell them, even though we tried a few times. So um, I have an answer how to convince that, because I haven't convinced the other organization to, to do that yet. Slowly, talks are happening, as they see. Uh, but it's really, my experience is really having the right person and, uh, and really trying to focus on that person within the organization, the decision maker that's going to be responsible for, for the platform. And since the beginning, so we're going to be building this, and uh, we wanted to give it back because, you know, you're leveraging this, this, and that from the community, and that's just the right thing to do. But there's no real recipe or, or happy way to for that, I guess. Yeah, I fully agree on, on the mindset. That's, that's the primary thing. Uh, the traditional enterprise mindset is that every paper says confidential on it, basically. Even if you look at, like, toilet paper or whatever, it's always confidential, everything. And you know you are trying to trying to patent everything if you can, and and then take all of your competition to the courts. That is pretty obvious these days if you read the news on what Apple and friends are doing uh, in the courts. You try to get patents on everything. Um, so that's the traditional mindset. And moving from that mindset to hey, let's work together with our competition to create more value for us. It's a pretty big leap. Uh, so it's something that. In, in many, especially in high-tech companies, I think it's a, it's a way too big of a leap to do at once. Um, so we have a lot of customers who do contribute back quite a bit, but none of them are actually in industries where it's really traditional to try to patent and make everything confidential. They are more in like uh, media and public sector and, and so on, different kinds of verticals. Uh, so. I think the only way to actually convince them to, to uh, contribute is to show them success stories. Uh, we have really lovely stories from our existing customers where they have been doing, let's say, upgrade from Drupal 5 to 7, and the custom modules we originally wrote for them have already all been upgraded for free to Drupal 7 because so many sites use those modules already. So they ended up saving a lot of money. And we have these kinds of stories to tell um, but I think they only work if, if, if the mindset is even somewhat in the same, same neighborhood. If it's completely on the closed side and no, nothing leaves this building ever unless somebody pays money for it, then it's going to be obvious and really, really difficult to, to sell. I don't think I've got much to add. I think the, um, the, the business cases that have worked 
you're always trying to change your mindset, but ch try and change it at the start rather than the end of the project. Um, and if, if dealing with government, always address security concerns. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, I have two two examples to add. Um, one is in in the government space and public sector. I think the the argument there is reuse. I think the 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 argument you can make uh, successfully is reuse. So you know, if if one if one government agency has developed something that meets certain regulation, um, it, it, and presumably done it with public funds, why would that same uh, uh, you know, a different agency have to go out and procure the same solution twice. So that's a very uh, academic argument. Uh, you get into the specifics and it becomes very difficult, but I think that that's uh, something that appeals to most people in, in public sector. Um, our experience on the commercial side or the enterprise side of things uh, is very similar to VESA's and, and Felipe's. It's, um, it's different organizations with different mindsets around legal um, in particular, but the most compelling argument I've found is is really just the dollars and cents of having someone else maintain that code for you and letting people know that um, if they put something back into the community, it's in essence being maintained for free. If they, they have to branch and do things on their own, they're in essence either paying their own staff or you as a vendor to potentially keep a branch of that code alive just so that they can use it down the road. And that's not a very good uh, business argument. So you try to attack it from that. Um, my experience with a lot of uh, commercial companies is they don't uh, react as well to the uh, open source uh, culture, if you will. It's more about the business sense. So, um, so uh, a specific question um, from an audience member about um, multi-sites, and, and I suppose also relates to governance in terms of how you manage um, users within your implementation. Uh, with multi-sites, what are the cost support and security implications, especially around people grabbing cool third-party components. So I'm assuming this is about stopping rogue users from uh, installing and using uh, components on, on a multi-site architecture. Um, I think this is, in the end, it's not a technology question as such. Uh, it's more about what sort of policies do you have in place? What sort of best practices you have in place? Uh, how do you train your people? Uh, you obviously don't let like just anyone install modules on, on any of your Drupal installations, or if you do, I think you have all sorts of problems anyway. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you're crazy developers, just go on and always install something and things break down. Uh, I think the problem is actually in, in some other place than, than your Drupal multi-site installation. It's about your, your culture of, of how do you work and what your uh, quality practices and, and so on. Um, I don't really think there even is a technical silver bullet for this. Uh, but of course, some of our devs might disagree with me on this, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I really, really think it's a, it's a people question, more or less. I mean, you could implement a lock-in so to prevent people from adding developers adding modules, but uh, it's not part of the, the standard. I guess you, you got it right. I mean, governance is the, it's really one of the customers uh, is basically defining what's going to be the, their platform, which means what's going to be the set of modules that got to be reused. And those are the standard modules as my organization. If we need to add a new one, it has to go through some enterprise process, which might delay the time to have that module available in the platform but it's really worth to prevent the rogue developers from adding anything they want, making sure that they're getting uh, uh, really stable modules, not just beta versions. If you're getting a beta version, you get some sort of blessing. But of course, without incurring on the traditional take a long time to add a module process, right? It still has to be agile, has to be fast, but some sort of control you gotta have in place to prevent that. But uh, really not technical, it's really about uh, ensuring it's, uh, you're doing the right thing and maintaining. Uh, one more thing to add on that might be that uh, building an organization where when something gets pushed to, to production, uh, it's not like these developers can do whatever and then you have the maintenance guys to clean up the mess. Make them clean up their own messes. <laughs> when, when they break everything uh, a few times and they have to clean it up and they have to explain to the customer when, why everything broke down, it sort of discourages them to do, do uh, like the craziest things, things at least. So. Um, that might be an easy fix in some cases. 
So related question about um, <clears throat> about how to handle coordination amongst people developing on Drupal. Um, how do you manage global development teams with a multi-site setup? So when teams need to develop on separate sites but also share some global functionality, how do you handle that sort of um, uh, coordination amongst those different uh, parts? Now, I would think that uh, Felipe might be good. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We have one big case where uh, we serve a moot site instance of Drupal in Europe, so about 15 to 20 countries now, I guess. Uh, and we start the support of that platform in Brazil and follow the same ma method or process. China continues that on the next time zone, right? So there's some intersection, but, uh, but still, how do we do it? So we use tools, so we make sure that we use Jira, all the communication goes smooth between the teams. And of course, the, the, the repository, the source code is shared. But uh, I guess the key is communication. There, there really isn't, even if it was a moot site, if it was just a regular site, uh, would be the same. It's just process, tools, and communication, and uh, and that's how we're, we're achieving that. It's, it's been a success right now. Um, but as far as multi-site, I, I don't see, uh, from a development standpoint, it's really about all the developers in both countries knowing how to, to deal with the code. Uh, of course, before transitioning to China, we started in Brazil, and then to China, uh, th there was a, a knowledge transfer phase, make sure that the team could handle that. But uh, just like you said, business as usual, you gotta make sure that uh, you're going to have your team spread out, so the key part is communication, how you manage communication. So there, there are quite a few uh, alternatives for that. Uh, yeah, we, we have a bit different situation where um, everybody is within two time zones, uh, basically, so communication is a bit easier. Uh, based on, on my personal experience, what I would say, like, make it work locally first. Uh, it's quite typical to go into distributed teams right away, but if it's possible, try to get everybody in the same room in the beginning when you are starting and grow it out from there. Uh, especially if you are trying to learn something new, like let's say you want to transform your, your organization into being agile. Uh, it's really difficult to do in the beginning if it's a distributed organization. It's much easier to do in the beginning when somebody is in the same room and the communication is quite a bit easier. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing we do um, in order to, to get people work cross borders is to basically make sure they, they meet face to face and drink some beer, more or less. <laughs> That's the thing. So we uh, airlines like us, uh, but of course those are short flights. Uh, so we get people together when we get new people uh, and, and we have a lot of projects where we have mixed teams because uh, our markets are in between of uh, let's say the UK and Latvia and the price difference can be, it's not exactly tenfold but almost. So there are like massive price differences uh, on, on the market. So Latvians can easily work to UK, but if we send somebody from the UK to, to a Latvian customer, that's gonna eat up the budget really quickly. So, so we can mix between markets, but, but we have to be a bit careful on how to mix. Uh, so mostly what this means is we, we just send people to stay at another office for extended periods like weeks or months. Uh, because working together is really all about knowing the people as well. Uh, so initially, they meet face to face, and when, when they actually get to know the teams and know the people, then it's no longer so important. You have to meet every now and then, uh, but not on a weekly or, or daily basis. Uh, we also do this if, if we have problems with the project. We get everybody on the same room, including the customer, and that, that tends to get problems fixed. So even with all the video conferencing and everything, the, the like FaceTime is, is still quite uh, invaluable in, in that. I think there's like 1,001 other things, but. Yeah, I, I was gonna go back to the governance as well. So uh, once you establish the process, so who is gonna be managing that platform, the global features, how that can be enabled across countries. And so gonna make sure that all the teams are aware of how things can be done. So it's uh, all about the governance of the platform. Okay. Uh, another very provocative Drupal question, since uh, it's after lunch and people need something. Try to give this one your just your, your most fiery answer you can give. Um, there's one thing about Drupal that frustrates you. What would it be? <laughs> okay, uh, one, only one. <laughs> I, I don't get to name many. Yeah. 
I'm gonna say the logo sucks. <laughs> I would think the um, one thing that is, I think, is underway in Drupal 8, and it's much better. I was just talking before the session. It's uh, the whole move to production uh, management. So that's something that is not perfect, and we we know that uh, other software, other products do better this. So managing the pushes between stage and prod, and and managing content in prod or staging. So depends on the maturity of your content author. So that's something that we had to either use a few modules, like deploy module, et cetera, and customize a little bit based on the requirements. But in the end of the day, I always ended up creating scripts to manage that the way they needed. So uh, I guess that's the part that we, as, as a system integrator, struggle more because every customer wanted to do, they want to do a different way. And uh, there's, no, there's not, not a single solution in the Drupal yet for that. We can do several ways, just like in this SDS uh, case, uh, there's different ways of doing things, and uh, and for that particular one, which I think is very critical, we should, as a community, eventually come out with two tops ways, or just one idea of doing those uh, content and, and code and configuration pushes between the environments. I guess that's the the thing that uh, we, as a, as a management support, as well as we do support, have to be very careful when pushing things uh, in different environments. Yeah, perhaps I can now try to uh, answer for real. I, I got my brain moving. It's three in the morning for me, so <laughs> sorry if I'm a bit slow. Um, I think my my personal like favorite topic on what's wrong with Drupal uh, today is Drupal marketing. Um, there's like us and Acquias and and all sorts of other companies out there doing a lot of Drupal marketing on their own. So I'm sure all of the markets have one or two or ten companies doing Drupal marketing all the time. Um, and we are basically doing the same things over and over and over again. Um, we've been trying to change this as, as we being the, the Drupal Association in this case where I'm, I'm a, a board member uh, as well. Uh, but it's, it's slow going and hopefully we get to change it at least slightly during this year already to, to pull all of the marketing things together. But it turns out doing open source marketing is quite a, quite a bit more difficult than, than technology because in marketing you can't do like branches and forks and everything all the time. Or you can, but it's not gonna be really great marketing and everybody wants to do like different marketing messages. Um, so I don't know, I hope we can do it because at least I'm, I'm sick of uh, paying for a lot of the, the European Drupal marketing on our own. Uh, I would much rather pay it together with everybody else. I, I, I'm sure Acquia feels the same way. <laughs> Uh, so that's probably my favorite topic at the moment. Um, I'd have to agree, agree with the rollout to production being a little bit messy um, and changing. Um, but I guess the other thing is that, it c like any CMS, it can get incredibly heavy incredibly quickly. I don't think there's a module for that. I think there's about 50 modules for that. Um, and making the wrong choices for the organization or for the, the solution um, can have a lot of consequences at the initial sort of phase doesn't really pick up. So I guess planning ahead and knowing the technology before you actually implement it. Yeah, I would think um, <clears throat> no one had actually asked a question, so I'm going to in insert my own question as part of this answer, which is talent. I think one of the things I've heard over and over again, um, and uh, I think Felipe mentioned it earlier, Ms. Vesa, is, you know, I mean, how many of you feel in general like you're struggling to get uh, the right resources, uh, either hired or, or contracted or whatever, just show a hand. How many people are struggling? Yeah, and that I mean that's a decent number of people. So um, I guess let me ask you guys a question: How do you how do you find good or develop uh, or build uh, good Drupal talent in the organizations that you work in? Like I said before, we uh, we develop our own training center within the organization. So uh, new developers, we get them, uh, of course, knowing programming skills, having programming skills, basic. And then if they know PHP, that's, of course, one step ahead. Otherwise, they go towards the, the learning PHP first phase and then go towards Drupal. And after a couple of years, we've been able to optimize this training in a way that we can uh, do it in a, in a couple of weeks and then have a developer almost as good as a, a guy that has been doing Drupal 
in four years. So, uh, but before that, was really struggling to find that initially in Brazil uh, and, and getting resource that would know Drupal, the level that we needed to those people to know. Uh, I feel I feel like there's a lot being done in that area. I, I remember Dries keynote uh, in Denver, I guess, last year about uh, the, the talent pool. I was a, a kid in the pool. Uh, so the Drupal training day uh, last year was, I think, the four editions were a success. There's a couple, hap there's four more happening this year as well. Uh, so I think things are getting better. Things are getting easier for us. Uh, starting to hire in China. Uh, so what was a better scenario than than in Brazil when I started down there and um, but it's still there's a, a bit of a challenge but uh, I think the, the association the community are doing uh, their their best towards that area I, I think I have to do this in, in two different parts because uh, we are in a sort of a strange situation we have too much people people are applying jobs and we have too much too many talented people applying for jobs we just can't take all of them in uh, and it's like part of that is we've always focused only on two primary things, customer satisfaction and, and employee satisfaction, basically. And this actually, it's a small community and we, we have a fairly solid reputation in the community. So people with experience apply for jobs. And um, we do have a lot of customer demand as well, but when it's, it's a consulting organization, so you can't throw in people like, let's take 50 people in right now. That would just break down the entire organization because you can only grow on a certain rate while still being profitable at the same time. Um, so, and, and this is all, all of the like, uh, there's all of these like triple hiring companies out there calling us every week, like, do you need new people? It's like, no, we have like 50 people lined up for, for like new jobs as soon as we can take them in. But I, I realize that this is globally definitely not the situation and, and even in Europe, most of our customers are trying to hire like small in-house teams and they have huge difficulties hiring and so on. Uh, so what we've done on that, that part is we've done cooperation with universities and, and done some like free training in universities to mostly to promote Drupal. Because if you go in for like two days or three days and you talk to them about Drupal and you teach them how to do stuff with that, you're not going to get like extremely talented Drupal people out of that. But hopefully you will get like people that are interested in Drupal and will learn it afterwards. And, and you will, in a few years time, you will get a lot of Drupal talent. Uh, so uh, training is, is one thing. Uh, another thing we are trying to push like uh, actively some sort of Drupal certification program. Uh, that's another of my personal favorites as well and going nowhere. Uh, but <laughs> hopefully one of these days we'll, we'll have so something like that. Um, so those things I think are probably the ones I can think of. Um, we attack it in a few ways. We have some full-time staff who are developers um, and designers and they have a fairly strong connection with one another and share learnings quite often. We hire in resources, whether it be individuals or consultancies when we're doing bigger projects and need more resources. Um, in terms of contracting out, we haven't always done found the best company, but we've found some good ones lately. Um, so I think it's a little bit of everything, making sure we're learning from previous projects and sort of upskilling while we go along. Um, I will say though that I think Drupal could do with a little bit more promotion in Australian universities. Um, I was working with some friends who are lecturers the other day um, and they sort of said, what's going on in industry? What should we be teaching? I did mention Drupal and apparently a whole lot of other senior, senior academics had said anything but Drupal. Um, so it, it does have a little bit of a perception problem in some areas and I think that could, could go a long way. Um, we do have some fairly talented programmers that are, that are still in, in school and still in university um, and I think tapping into that would be a huge bonus for Australia because I know that we do at times have limitations. Okay, so um, you're trying to convince your, your boss, your customer, someone, uh, someone that you believe needs to be on Drupal. What is the, what are the, what are the top things that you think uh, make Drupal? Uh, what are the selling points for Drupal that you think are, are incredibly important for people to understand besides cost? I'm going to go with one of my favorite ones that isn't used often enough. There is competition. Um, I know I work for the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, but I've also worked in other parts of government where they've sort of locked themselves down to a single vendor technology and 
just the impact on that and the delays that you can incur. Um, so I do think that there's competition out there and that it's broadly used. I don't think people understand how often it's broadly used. So selling some of the, the success stories, um, but that there's also quite a few companies that support it and good ones. I would go with uh, with the references, existing Drupal sites out there and, and the community being the two primary things. Um, these are really special for Drupal, even if you compare against other open source uh, communities and other open source products. Um, it's pretty difficult to find any product that would have as great references as, as Drupal has globally. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, it's really to beat the almost a million developers, I guess, uh, in the in the DO that we can see over there registered. Uh, it's really hard. So showing off the community, the what you can get out of that community, basically what I sell is, is time to market. So uh, especially for, for the commercial area, if you really wanted to get a module uh, after a new social network has just come out a couple of weeks ago, most likely you're going to have a module, like Xena said in the beginning. Someone has built that. So it's really fast for you to really keep up with the market. And that, along with flexibility as well, which gives you too much power, so you have to have control of that responsibility. But the flexibility of Drupal is really a key point uh, when, I, when I'm selling to, to different organizations as well. Okay, we're almost done. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit just, uh, the, just to see if we can get our panelists back uh, answering some tough questions, throwing them a lot of softballs here. I wanna, wanna get a tough one out there. So does anybody in the audience have a real stumper for this, uh, this crew up here? Have a question you want to ask the, the panel right now? Live question? Something hard? Come on. All right. Where will the web be in 10 years? Ooh. Where will the web be in 10 years? Come on. That's an easy one. Um, <laughs> I think it's going to be uh, quite a bit like it's today. It's just going to be a lot more of everything and, and a lot more of everywhere. Yeah, I guess it probably goes down to the same point ab about the Internet of Things. Um, uh, get Getting a little bit more technical about the APIs, so being able to provide, like uh, I guess B was saying uh, in the keynote, uh, about being able to provide data and services uh, across the board. So I guess that's where we're going to be able to reach out to, to any API anywhere and get the data uh, and, and, and provide uh, business value uh, for whatever whatever we're building. So I guess uh, that's the, the, the rest for APIs. That's a key part. Uh, s evolving some, somehow in 10 years, de definitely. But I think we're going to be sticking with the, this standard, which I think is, is great. Um, I do hope that big business and government sort of set the tone and do develop shared standards and that there's not so much clutter and noise and that it is a bit more open because I am very strongly into equality of access for information. Um, but I think there's also risk of it going the other way um, and various countries around the world controlling and, and limiting access. So I do think that we have an incredible power but we also have an incredible risk. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate all the great questions you had, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for uh, giving us your thoughts and your time. So, everyone, please thank the panelists.